2000 was less of a debt cycle and more of an equity cycle. The debt cycle in 2008 really was the kind of end of the financial system. It was the point that we all knew was coming, which is like, you can't have this much leverage. Look at what's happening. We're decentralizing power. So now people can have their power consum um, their power source of power at their houses. So therefore, you don't need the huge storage. People say, well, you can't scale solar. Well, you can at a house level. You can do it probably at a village level. So what you're doing is decentralizing the entire grid. Real Vision CEO Raul Pal explains that there's a simple pattern, or cycle, that connects many things like Bitcoin, the economy, and even presidential elections. He believes this cycle started after the 2008 financial crisis when governments lowered interest rates and printed more money. This created a regular four-year cycle where things like business growth and asset prices like stocks and Bitcoin follow the same ups and downs. Let us now view clips of Raul Pal as he shares his insights about the current market. Please give this video a like to show your support and subscribe for your daily dose of crypto news. We hope you enjoy. Before we continue with the rest of the video, do check out daily 5-minute crypto newsletter with all the latest crypto and Bitcoin news. It's a fantastic analysis of on-chain crypto data and breakdowns, and the best part is it's absolutely free. They'll cover expert predictions, breakdowns of on-chain crypto data, and any breaking news you need to know, all in a nutshell. Click the first link in the description and enter your email to join over 50,000 others in becoming a better crypto investor right now. Yeah, and what's weird about the everything code, and I'll explain what it is. What's weird is it makes everything so simple. Too simple. That most people think, well, this can't be possible. Yeah. We kind of knew it in Bitcoin world because we could see a cycle forming. And we've been following this cycle kind of dumbly, like, well, it's kind of maybe just the halving cycle. We don't really know. And then I started digging in and realized that the business cycle was perfect. So the business cycle, I use the ISM survey, and it was a perfect cycle. I'm like, that's weird. Because if you remember, if you go back prior to 2008, we'd have these long periods of no recession, short periods, and it was, not, it was variable. But suddenly it's like a metronome, as you say. I'm like, huh, what's that all about? And eventually it led me to realize that 2008, I think was the Great Reset. The one that people keep expecting happened. What they did is they basically for, they, they told everybody they could forego paying interest on all their debts, which was zero interest rates. And then they tried the new trick of printing money via quantitative easing. Now, what that did is allow every single major government in the world to refinance all of their debts on this three to five year sector. And so they all did it. And what it did was force the business cycle into this four year cycle. And then all the asset prices are all correlated, whether it's tech, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's the economy itself, it's all driven by the same cycle, which happens to be the presidential election cycle, which happens to be the Bitcoin halving cycle. It's all the same thing. And so when you understand that, it makes the game a lot easier. Now, this is not going to last forever. But for the period of time that we've got, it seems to be playing out perfectly. And you can break these cycles down to four phases, which I call the seasons. So we have, call it crypto or macro winter. Well, that was 2022. That was 2018. That was uh, 2014. That is four years. The next part of that is spring, when nobody quite believes that something is changing but prices start moving higher. You know, Bitcoin had a great year in, in 2023 against most people's expectations because spring is the time the shoots come up. Then you start transitioning into summer, which is this year, which happens to be the election year, which is when really the debt starts getting refinanced and they have to start using liquidity to finance it because there's not enough GDP growth to pay for the interest on the debts. And so they keep rolling forwards these debts and they keep monetizing the interest payments, which is this debasement of currency that happens at about, on a globalized level, 8% a year. They're debasing currency. And so, and then next year will be um, macro fall. And then eventually the cycle tops out and we repeat it again because it's based on the debt refi cycle. Right. That this debasement of currency of 8%, there's two ways of looking at it. You can say, rightly so, we're being robbed of our future wealth. 
because your future self is getting poorer because you can afford less assets with your income. Because income doesn't go up, the assets do because of the debasement. Or the other way is you can say, I'm paying an 8% put option fee on the entire system not breaking. Because that's also what they're doing. Because they need to refinance the debt. They need to not let asset prices go too far down. So we can talk about that, but it's another way of looking at it. And you're like, would you pay 8% a year to have the entire system not break? Maybe. 2000 was less of a debt cycle and more of an equity cycle. The debt cycle in 2008 really was the kind of end of the financial system. It was the point that we all knew was coming, which is like, you can't have this much leverage. And if the collateral, which happens to be house prices, which is not a volatile collateral, once that starts, it put a, a collateral call on the entire system. And faced with the entire blowing up of everything, they decided to stop it. Now, I don't think they quite understood what they were doing at that point. But then Europe had the same issue in 2012, four years later, you know, this four-year cycle. Then Europe the governments couldn't pay the debt. Okay, now this was a sovereign crisis of giant nations. And Draghi said, I'll do whatever it takes. Right, and what that. that was, was I will debase the currency to stop the collateral falling so we can shore up the system. That then magnified the whole thing. This is the time I got into Bitcoin back in 2012, because I was living in Europe and you know it got so bad that I was buying tin food and a generator because I thought we were gonna lose our banking system. Wow. Because everyone, you know, I was living in Spain. Spain was forced to take a bailout of $19 billion. They didn't wanna take it, and we thought we were gonna lose the banks. Cyprus obviously lost its banking system. They took the money out of everybody's accounts. But what was interesting at that point, I went around the world trying to start the world's safest bank with um, a bunch of friends of mine, some family offices and stuff like that. and. We had had a private meeting with the DTCC and Euroclear and the New York Fed. Now, the DTCC and Euroclear, they're the custodians of the entire system. And Euroclear, I'd read somewhere, had had to lend emergency money when Lehman went under, $50 billion. And so I asked them, I said, what was the collateral for that loan? And they said, oh, we had to use the the positions from all of the the, the members of, of Euroclear. And I'm like, is that customer or house account? I, is it mingled? And they're like, oh, it's all mingled at our level. I, we have a claim on all assets. I'm like, okay. And then I spoke to the DTCC and I said, well, oh no, I spoke to Euroclear and said, what happens if Spain or Italy went bust? They said, then the entire collateral of the system is gone and it's a total wipeout of everything. That's when I realized how important the government debt was. I asked the, the DTCC and the New York Fed the same question, and they said, yes, they would lend if JP Morgan went under or something. They would lend money to the system, and they would take customer positions as collateral. I'm like, okay, so you don't actually own anything. And I asked the New York Fed, I said, what is the leverage in U.S. treasuries? And they said, we think treasuries are levered up to 42 times. Wow. So there's 42 claims on the same asset if shit hits the fan. That's what they're scared of. And that, I think, they had the realization in 2012. And I think they all understood the game, which was, okay, we're going to have to continue to monetize this until we can grow our way out of it, if we can. He breaks this cycle into four seasons. Winter, when things are tough. Spring, when things start to improve. Summer, when debts are refinanced and money is printed to keep things going. And fall when the cycle peaks and then starts over. This pattern might not last forever, but for now, it makes understanding these big trends easier. Now, here are more clips of Raul Pell. Look at what's happening. We're decentralizing power. So now people can have their power, um, their power source of power at their houses. So therefore, you don't need the huge storage. People say, well, you can't scale solar. Well, you can at a house level. You can do it probably at a village level. So what you're doing is decentralizing the entire grid. Now, look what Microsoft and Amazon are doing with nuclear and, and OpenAI. They're going to scale small nuclear plants next to these very important massive GPU clusters. So I think we're seeing decentralized power, decentralized AI. What are robotics? They'll probably end up being some sort of decentralized labor force. 
centralized and then decentralized. I don't know how that works. Decentralized money. So I think I think you're dead right. Yeah. So that's that, that's where we're going. I mean, we're starting to get into you know all of this economic economic singularity parts of how much the world economy is going to change. But listen, you're going to see the next version of ChatGPT is probably going to be agentic. So what agents in AI mean is. You're starting a business, Mark. You go on to Fiverr and say, hey, you build me a deck. You do me some brand design. You do me some copy. You pay these guys small amounts of money. They're agents. But AI can do agents now at scale and speed. And it'll create its own agents because AI is smart enough to build this stuff. So you get this multiple agent world where AI asks the agent to do something. So Mark now instead goes to ChatGPT5 and says, Hey, listen, I want to build a business that does X, Y, Z, and I'm going to need to get registered. I need to have my deck prepared, need blah, blah, blah. And ChatGPT will do it all using other agents. Now, to your point, last time I checked, an AI can't get a utility bill, and therefore it can't open a bank account. Now, it's going to have to pay because people don't yet understand that all AI has a cost, and it has two costs. It has compute and it has electricity. So if you're going to call, much like a Fiverr person, you're going to, and you might go to the Philippines because it's a lower cost, you're going to have to pay, the one AI is gonna to have to pay the other AI for the cost of compute, and maybe a profit margin. Maybe it's a profitable agent. <laughs> In fact, it should be. Why, why would it not be? Because it can accumulate more. It's the game that humanity's always played. So in that case, the only way of doing this is crypto rails. There's no other way apart from using blockchain for micropayments, fast transactions, recorded ownership, who has what. You know, you need smart contracts to have contractual terms between stuff. So, yes, I mean, I don't think people yet understand how, because we all think of blockchain technology in the ways that we know it now. But in the end, nothing can run without it. Roel Powell reveals that future AI like the next version of ChatGPT, will be able to create and manage its own agents to perform tasks, making it easier to start businesses and handle complex projects. However, since AI still has costs like computing power and electricity, blockchain and cryptocurrencies will be crucial for managing payments and contracts between AI agents. He believes that blockchain technology will become essential as AI continues to evolve. What about you? What do you think about the role of blockchain in the future of AI-driven economies? Do you see it as essential? Or do you think there's another way forward? Share your thoughts in the comments section below and continue the discussion. If you found value in this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more insightful discussions on cryptocurrency and finance. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you again. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.